Hello everyone, welcome again to uh, Biofluid Mechanics and um, what we're going to do today is uh, we're going to implement the simplified model of the cardiovascular circuit that we formulated in last lecture. Uh, remember we ended up uh, generating the set of equations for the five-state variable system, uh, the, the model of the cardiovascular circuit and, um, and that is a state system of equations that again has uh, five unknowns, but also it's a state system of equation that is switched between four different states uh, depending on the conditions, depending on the whether the valves, uh, either the two valves are open or closed, so generating four possible states. Uh, so again, what we're going to do today is we are going to first define some parameters, some physiologically relevant or feasible parameters uh, for, for the different uh, the different elements that we introduce into the, in the circuit. The, those are the uh, resistance of the mitral valve and the compliance of the left atrium, the compliance of the left ventricle, which we've already defined through the double heel function, uh, the resistance of the uh, aortic valve, uh, the compliance of the aorta, the resistance of the aorta, the inductance of the aorta, the compliance of the systemic circulation, the resistance of the systemic circulation. So we'll define what are physically uh, or physiologically relevant values for these different parameters and uh, introduce them into the set of equations. Okay, so let me switch here. So this will be uh, lecture 23, Biofluid Mechanics. lecture number 23. So this is what we had done. Um, we had defined this so-called simplified and I'm going to call it lumped parameter parameter model LPM. This is how we call these this circuits uh, with RLC compartments, the slum parameter model of the cardiovascular circuit, in which we had defined to begin with this uh, node is the pressure of the left atrium with a corresponding compliance of the left atrium, then uh, a resistance of the mitral valve that separates the atrium from the ventricle, the mitral valve itself, and then a node defining the pressure on the left ventricle with its corresponding compliance, which is a function of time. This is the one that is going to be defined by that double heel function, the Sturgiopoulos function. Furthermore, we have another resistance. This is the resistance of the aortic valve, the aortic valve itself, and then the pressure at the aorta at this node with its corresponding um, compliance of the aorta. Furthermore, we have the resistance of the aorta, the inductance of the aorta, and the corresponding flow through the aorta, that's another state variable. And finally, we have a note indicating the systemic pressure with its corresponding systemic compliance and a corresponding systemic resistance that closes the loop over to the other side. So this is the direction that the flow takes, obviously. And uh, we had uh, established that the order in which we define and formulate this set of state variables just like this. First, the pressure of the left atrium, then the pressure of the left ventricle, 
then the pressure of the aorta, then Q of the aorta, and then the systemic pressure. Which, by the way, is just a specific order that I decided to use. You can use whatever order you want. It's just that the set of resulting equations will result shifted from the ones that we derived uh, last time. And these led to a system of equation. That looks like this. Where the S stand for switched state. And that would depend on whether the mitral valve and the aortic valve is open, open. So this will be state one, state two, state three, and state four. So if this is open and this is open, um, I think the second one we selected was, uh, let me see, uh, state number two, we selected of this one being open and this one being closed. Then we selected one where this one was closed and this one was open. And then the final state was where both valves are closed. So let's just create a table out of these. All right. Furthermore, we had determined that for every one of these state of equations, or this is or this, this, every one of these switch states, the right hand side vector B is always equal to zero. There is no uh, forcing function or right hand side vector of independent terms because there is no external force driving the circuit. There's no pump or voltage generator or pressure generator driving the circuit. So therefore, there's actually no external uh, source. So let's write that again. For all switch states, B1, B2, B3, and B4 are all equal to each other and equal to zero. So it's just a vector of zero, so five zeros. Now, when that happens, when we have a system of equations like this, and the system of equation is homogeneous, homogeneous meaning that there is no, no independent term, uh, the solution of a system of a linear system of equation like this uh, with no independent term will be trivial, meaning that the solution will be zero. So an allowable solution for a system where this vector is equal to zero is y equal to zero because the derivative of y is also equal to zero and any matrix times zero will always give you zero. So that is an allowable solution. Now, how do we get out of that bind? How do we get out of the trivial solution? Well, what we need to do is actually impose non-homogeneous initial conditions. So the only way to get out of the trivial solution is by imposing initial conditions that are not zero, non-trivial. If we start with zero initial conditions for Y and the system is homogeneous, meaning that this vector is equal to zero, then the solution will always be zero. So therefore, if the system is started from a zero initial initial condition, the solution will be trivial. That is, y of t will also be zero. So we'll get a solution that is always zero at any value of time. Therefore, it is very important to start from a physiologically meaningful 
set of initial conditions. So what I mean by this is that you have to start from something that makes sense, where the initial pressures and initial flow of the left atrium, left ventricle, aorta, the flow in the aorta, and the systemic pressure have values that actually make sense. So these are, we're going to start with something like 10, 10, 80, 0, and 80. And let me explain my rationale behind these numbers. So at the beginning of the system or at the beginning of the cycle, remember, we're going to be driving this circuit using the uh, left ventricular compliance. And the left ventricular compliance starts at the point of the onset of systole, when the ventricle starts contracting. At that point, at the zero point of that, of that phase, the pressure on the left atrium and the pressure of the ventricle are equal to each other and are basically at the minimum value. So basically the return pressure of the venous system going into the left atrium, which might not be 10, it might be something like seven millimeters of mercury, but it will actually self adjust. All you have to do is start from values that are non-zero and are sort of physically relevant. They're in the same vicinity or in the same order of magnitude as, as physical values in millimeters of mercury. So the left atrium and the left ventricle both at the same pressure and in the order of magnitude of the pressure dictated by the atrial return, by the venous blood return into the left, the left atrium. Now, at the beginning of systole, the aortic pressure is the diastolic pressure, right? But the minimum value is 80 or 70 millimeters of mercury. So more like 70 in a healthy adult or 75 millimeters of mercury. But we're going to start with 80. And again, this is going to adjust as you solve the, as you progress to the time steps into the different cycles. Uh, of, of the heart cycle, then these values will be, be properly adjusted to what they need to be. Now the flow, we can just leave at zero because it will actually come out, come out of the zero into a into an actual physical uh, re uh, relevant value. And, and in fact, at the beginning of systole, when all the valves are closed, the aortic flow is actually zero. So we're going to start with that value of zero. By the way, the initial conditions need not be non-homogeneous for all of them. Only at least, at least one of the initial condition needs to be different than zero for the entire solution set to be non-trivial. So as long as one of these numbers is different than zero, we will get a solution. It's just that we are trying to use values that are physically relevant, physiologically meaningful, so that it, the, 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 the numerical solution uh, algorithm takes less time in adjusting for the actual proper solution. And also the physiological, or I'm sorry, the systemic pressure equals the uh, the uh, uh, the aortic pressure at the beginning of systole okay there's no uh, there's no difference between the two um, there's this one is usually a little smaller than the aortic pressure because this one has gone through the uh, systemic circulation so in fact this is going to be adjusted always to be uh, smaller than this one but this is a good time or a good place to start okay now in addition to this we also need to use physiologically meaningful circuit parameters. What I mean by this is that in our circuit, we have, again, compliance of, uh, of a left atrium, compliance of a left ventricle, compliance of the aorta, resistance of the aorta, resistance of the inductance of the aorta, and, and systemic resistance. We need to use actual values that represent physiologically relevant parameters for those. Okay, so for example, for healthy adults, this is what we'll see. And in the case of the resistances, we have the resistance of the mitral valve, something in the order of 0 0.005 millimeters of mercury per milliliter second. The resistance of the aortic valve, something on the same order, 
millimeters of mercury millimeters second. The resistance of the aorta, something in the order of 0 0.0398 millimeters of mercury milliliter second. And the systemic resistance, that's something that doesn't have an actual fixed number, that it depends on whether the person is active or inactive. So it will be something in the order between 0 0.5 and 2 millimeters of mercury per milliliter second. And actually we had discussed this value uh, in the introduction to the class. We say that if a person is highly active, the systemic resistance will go down. down. So this is for a highly active. So if you enter high levels of activity, if you're working out, for example, running, your systemic resistance will go down to this value to allow more blood into the system. And if you're at rest, you're in high levels of rest, for example, if you're sleeping or laying down, the systemic resistance can go down all the way to, can go up all the way to two millimeters of mercury per milliliter second. All right. Now, In the case of the compliances, what we have is for the left atrium, we have a value of 4.4 uh, milliliters per millimeters of mercury. For uh, the aorta, we have 0 0.08 milliliters per millimeter mercury. And systemic circulation, we have about 1.33. That is basically the combination of all the elements in the systemic circulation that includes um, all the our peripheral arteries, arterioles, uh, capillaries, venules, veins, including the right heart and so on and so forth, all together produce a compliance, combined compliance of 1.33. And then there is the compliance of the left ventricle. But remember that is a function of time that is given by the double hill function. So that one is not a number, but an actual function of time that will program and let, uh, and let, and, 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 uh, use it in the system. All right. Now for the case of the inductance, which there's only one in the system, the inductance of the aorta, something in the order of 0 0.0005. So five times 10 to the minus four millimeters of mercury times milliliters second square. All right. Now, these are the parameters that we're going to use in the MathCAD spreadsheet that we're going to implement today. But before we do so, I want to explain something relevant to, uh, relevant to the meaning or the physiological meaning of these switch states, what, what they actually mean in physiological terms. Um, AS, well, and for that matter, also BS, although those are all zeros, state, matrix, and vector of four switched states. physiologically represent the ventricular phases of the cardiac cycle. What that is, is that the cardiac cycle the ventricle goes through different modes and those modes are actually mathematical mathematically represented by these switch states in the system of equations so let's let's look at the mode and let's look at uh, the valve which is the mitral and the aortic and uh, let's look at the meaning of these what's the cardiac phase just call it cardiac phase. So so
So we start with uh, mode number one, um, where the mitral valve is closed and the aortic valve is closed. This is the beginning of the cardiac phase and it's called the isovulimic contraction. It's essentially when the fibers of the ventricle are contracting and the in, in, in order to increase the internal pressure of the ventricle. The, both valves are closed and and then uh, nothing is happening but just pressure is being developed inside the ventricle so that it can actually make enough pressure to eject the flow. Mode number two, this one remains closed and this one is open. And notice that the mode number that I'm using is different from the mode number that I used in the definition, in the notes definition last time. We had the fine mode one as the one where both valves are open, but now I am actually synchronizing the modes with the cardiac phase. What happens at the beginning of cardiac phase? And then, then, then what's next? After enough isovolumic contraction, uh, enough pressure is developed inside the ventricle to, op to open the aortic arc, uh, the, the aortic valve. And when the aortic valve is open, that starts the peri period of ejection. So blood actually flows from the ventricle into the aorta. Then, after enough blood is released from the ventricle to the aorta, the pressure inside the ventricle is reduced, and when it's reduced enough, the valve actually closed. And this one still remained closed. So we're, we go back to mode number one. And this is the beginning of the phase of isoulimic relaxation. So it's the beginning of, cyst of diastole. And then, once that re once the relaxation is enough, the pressure in the left atrium will decrease. Uh, the pressure in the ventricle will decrease enough so that this valve now opens because the pressure in the atrium is larger than the pressure in the ventricle. Well, this one remains closed, and that will be phase number three, and this is the phase of filling. Okay, so there is a. Another state that we mathematically define in which both valves are open, but that is, although mathematically possible, is not physiologically possible. So there's another state which we can call four, where both valves are open, and this is not feasible. So essentially, there will never be a time within the cardiac cycle where both atrioventricular valve and ventricular aortic valve, so the mitral or the aortic valve will be simultaneously open. That will actually short circuit the circuit because it will actually let flow through directly from the venous system, system all the way to the aorta and actually bringing down the pressures all the way down and not good for anybody. So this is not possible in, under any circumstances. Okay, and you will see, again, we'll define it mathematical, mathematically. We'll define the system or the, the matrix A for the case when both valves are open. We actually uh, already formulated that in, in our last lecture. And then we'll, we'll implement that into the code. It's just that that matrix will never, be, will never be called because there will never be conditions in the system within any of the uh, phases of the cardiac cycle where uh, the conditions will be enough to open both valves simultaneously. So that, that will never occur. All right, so let me, uh, let me go back to, um, again, to the circuit. This is what we are going to be looking at. This is what we're going to be representing. And, uh, and let me go to MathCat to go over the, the code that I put together for these. All right, so to begin with, this, as usual, we, uh, we, we define, like we did in lecture 21, we define the double heel function for the left ventricular elastance. Okay. And let's start by saying that E max and E min are two and 0 0.06 respectively. Uh, these remember, um, are the values for, uh, the healthy heart or the healthy left ventricle of an adult, uh, where the maximum elastance goes all the way to two. Okay. Let's assume that this person is at rest. So the heart rate is 60. Therefore, the period of the 
uh, of the heart cycle is one second, 60 divided by heart rate. The, the um, shifted period of the heart cycle is, uh, again, 0 0.2 plus 0 0.15 times that period of TC is 0 0.35. And again, this is just for the normalized elastance value uh, uh, function. Okay, so we define the normalized elastance function as we did in lecture 21, given by this uh, rather strange formula. But again, it's a formula that has no physical uh, meaning. It's just a formula that very well fits what the uh, behavior of the, of the left ventricle is under this regular circumstance. Then we take that normalized elastance and we kind of explode it into the, uh, within the values of Emax and Emin. And therefore we denormalize it. And we also denormalize the time. By doing so, we can plot the elastance of this ventricle of a healthy adult under uh, a heart rate of 60 to be like this. And we've already seen this curve before. Also, what we'll need in the, in the, um, in the formulation, in the matrix, is not only the value of the elastance, we need the inverse of the elastance, which is the compliance of the left ventricle. The compliance of the left ventricle is equal to the uh, inverse of the elastance. Um, so we can see that that goes from somewhere around 1 to something around 16.667. So it changes, uh, you know, a few, almost two orders of magnitude. And we also need the value of the, um, of the uh, derivative of the, of the compliance of the left ventricle because that goes in the set of equations. Okay. And also we have to make sure that uh, we're careful in evaluating this derivative at time equals zero. Again, remember this function doesn't have any physical meaning. It's just some weird irrational exponential function that uh, has some weird powers. And therefore, when you differentiate it, it's just going to give you, give you even something weirder. And it's so weird that when you evaluate it at time equals zero, it gives you an imaginary number. So we have to make sure that we don't ever evaluate this at time equals zero. By the way, another thing is that this function only works for time values within the heart cycle. So if the heart cycle lasts one second, this function only works between zero and one second. So if you want to actually go and evaluate five or 10 heart cycles, you have to repeat the use of these, uh, of these, um, um, of these function and, 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 and sort of restart time at zero at the beginning of, of a very hard cycle. So we're going to take a slightly different, different approach when we discretize our time values uh, for the different heart cycles. Okay. So this is the plot of the derivative of the compliance of the left ventricle. And this is the plot of that derivative. Um, I'm sorry, this is the plot of the compliance of the left ventricle, and this is the plot of the derivative of the compliance divided by the compliance, which is another term that goes into the set of equations. All right, so these are the physiologically relevant parameters uh, or circuit parameters that we uh, went over in, the, in, in our notes. We said that the resistance of the mitral valve is 0 0.005. Again, no units necessary because we, we have all consistent units uh, throughout. So let's say that this, uh, this is obviously millimeters of mercury over milliliter second. The uh, uh, aortic valves has the same value. The aorta has a value of 0 0.0398 millimeters of mercury per milliliter second. And the systemic resistance, we're going to assume that this person is at rest. You know, at highest possible rest, the systemic resistance is about two millimeters of mercury per milliliter second. That's when a person is sleeping. But let's say that this person is actually laying down and the uh, heart rate is 60, and the systemic resistance is 1.5. This, uh, this person has almost zero level of activity. The compliance of the left atrium, 4.4, the compliance of the aorta is 0 0.08, the compliance of systemic circulation, 1.33, and the inductance of the aorta, 0 0.00005, so five times 10 to the minus four. All right, so what we're going to do is instead of defining a final time uh, for analysis, for numerical integration, um, and a number of time steps in between, what we're going to do is just basically define a number of heart cycles that we want to analyze. So in this particular case, I want to analyze five cycles. Okay. And NS, that's NC, and NS is the number of time steps that I'm going to be using within each cycle. I'm, I'm, I'm calling it an S because it's basically the number of samples or steps which in, with, within each cycle. So essentially the time step size, delta T, is 
the duration of a heart cycle, TC, which is a period of one heart cycle, in this case one second, divided by the number of steps within the cycle. And what we're going to do is evaluate 2,000 times 5 time steps to go all the way to the fifth, to the end of the fifth heart cycle. Okay, so N, which is, uh, is this range variable, we're going to start at 1 and finish it at NC times NS, again, from 1 to 10,000 cycles or 10,000 time steps that we're going to advance. So the um, array that contains the values of time, Tn equals delta T times N minus 1. So the Tn is, a, is an array that has 10,000 elements that goes from 0 all the way up to 5 seconds because there's 5 cycles, each of duration, 1 second. So if we follow this approach, rather than defining the final time and the number of time steps, it's, it's going to be a little clearer because if we change the heart rate to something different than 60, it really doesn't matter. It's still going to be able to evaluate five heart cycles. Okay, so let's say that we change the heart rate to um, 90, um, which which then means that the heart the the duration of the heart cycle is about 0.66 seconds. Then we don't have to adjust anything. It just basically says that we are going to analyze five cycles, each one with 2,000 time steps. It's just that the final time of calculation is not going to be five seconds. It's going to be five times 0.66 seconds. All right. So the number of uh, um, <coughs> state variables is equal to five. Excuse me. The number of state variables is equal to five, and this is the definition of the state variables. And by the way, this is just a definition. This is just a display equal. I'm not just. It's just for visual purposes. That doesn't define anything into why. It's just for for me to remember the order in which these state variables are defined. Okay. This one does define the uh, initial conditions. As we wrote on the notes, we're going to start with the initial conditions of 10, 10, 80, 0, and 80 for the pressure of the left atrium, pressure of the left ventricle, pressure in the aorta, the flow in the aorta, and the pressure in the systemic system, in the, the systemic pressure. Um, in addition to that, we're going to define this value epsilon, which is not a tolerance or an error threshold or anything like that. The reason I define epsilon is so that, that, that I never evaluate the derivative of the left ventricular compliance at time equals zero. So I'm always going to shift the evaluation of the derivative of the compliance value uh, by, a, by 10 to the minus six seconds. So that I never evaluate it at zero seconds. So if you look at the, at the different state matrices, so these are the state matrices that correspond to the close close um, uh, the valve, when the two valves are closed and closed, mitral valve and aortic valve, then aortic, uh, mitral valve and aortic valve open close, then close open, mitral valve, aortic valve, and then open open, mitral valve, aortic valve. And notice that these correspond exactly to how we define them in, uh, in the notes on lecture 22, last lecture. So, so essentially when two valves are closed, this is uh, this is the uh, the set of parameters that go into the coefficients of the matrix, and uh, and notice that I'm using this epsilon here to evaluate uh, the derivative of the left ventricular compliance, not at time equal t, but at time equal t plus epsilon, so that I shift the evaluation of that, so that it actually prevents it from ever evaluating at a time equal zero. And remember that when we evaluate this at time equal zero, we'll get a We'll get an, a, a, an imaginary number, and uh, an imaginary number will actually throw all the, the computations away because uh, it will actually blow up. It will assume that this is an infinity or not a number. All right, so when the mitral valve is open and the aortic valve is closed, the system of equations, particularly equation one and two, change from the previous one because there is an extra contribution from the from the mitral valve there's a mitral valve flow and therefore there's contribution from that when the aortic valve is open and the mitral valve is closed then there's contribution from the aortic valve in equation two and equation three okay nothing changes in equation four and five ever and when both valves are open there's contribution from the mitral valve in equation one and equation two and there's contribution on the for, from the aortic valve in equation two and equation three now remember that these particular one, even though it's not physically possible, we'll still define it. We'll still use it because we will we'll define the condition 
in the in the algorithm and say, well, when the two pressures correspond to the values that will make these two valves be open, use this matrix. Even though that's never going to be called, and it's never going to be possible, we still need to define that condition. All right. Now, in this particular algorithm, I'm using uh, the Runge-Kutta approach, the same one I've been using for, for the last few lectures. Um, however, I am not implementing the um, the adapted time stepping. Okay? So I'm making sure, like in this case I did, that I use enough time steps. In this case, I'm using 2,000 time steps per second, and therefore the size of the time step is 5 times 10 to the minus 4 seconds. So it's 0 0.5 milliseconds. It's a very, very tiny time step. It's going to cost us because it's not going to be very efficient, but at least we'll get a solution. Now, the reason why I didn't implement adaptive time stepping is because this particular algorithm would have, get, would have, would have gotten very, very long. Okay, Because not, now, not only I need to uh, uh, worry about two valves, four different possible switch states, then I would need to actually perform these uh, adaptive time stepping by by advancing in time in one shot and then in two shots and comparing, calculating the error in reverse, and then determining whether I need to break up the time step into into more time steps. And that would have actually tripled the size of this algorithm, which is already large. So for the purpose of illustration, that we already know how the adapted time stepping works, and we already implemented it. Uh, but for the purpose of illustration of this particular uh, uh, simplified circuit of the cardiovascular system, um, or the simplified model, we, I'm just going to use the plain old um, uh, runge -Kut. All right. So here it is. So I'm going to define A1, B1, A2, B2, A3, B3, and A4, B4. And I am going to use a combination of them depending on whether some conditions are true or not. All right. So, so here it is. So notice that if the current, so I'm going to advance in time again from one uh, and C from one to the number of cycles that I said that I was going to evaluate. And then S is the number of steps within each cycle. So one to the number of steps within each cycle. So I got some, uh, an embedded loop here instead of a single loop over all time steps. Um, and then I'm going to ask the question. If uh, pressure in the left atrium is larger than the pressure uh, on the left ventricle, and the pressure on the left ventricle is less than the pressure in the aorta, that's what state variable 1, 2, and 3 are, then that means that the state, the corresponding state, is the OC state. Essentially, the OC state is the state where the mitral valve is open and the aortic valve is closed. By default, I'm going to set the matrices A1, A2, A3, A4, and A4 as the closed closed state. I'm going to assume that both valves are closed. But if this condition is true, then I'm going to replace those values with the open closed matrix. However, if pressure on the left atrium is less than the pressure on the left ventricle, and the pressure on the left ventricle is larger than the pressure on the aorta, then the aortic valve needs to open. So instead of using OC, I'm going to use CO. So I'm going to replace the values of A1, A2, A3, and A4 with ACO, ACO at time plus 0 0.5 seconds, ACO at time plus 0 0.5 seconds, and ACO at time plus delta T. I'm using these values to actually calculate for the different uh, stages of the runge kutta solver, K1, K2, K3, and K4, the first predictor and the three correctors. Remember, the predictor is calculated at time equal T, and then corrector K2, K3 are calculated at time uh, equal T plus 0 0.5 uh, delta T, and corrector K4 is calculated at time equals T plus delta T. So this is what A1 through K4 mean. And finally, if the pressure in the left atrium is larger than the pressure on the left ventricle, that means that the mitral valve will be open, and the pressure of the left ventricle is larger than the pressure of the aorta, that means that the aortic valve will also be open, then I'm going to use the open open matrices to calculate A1, A2, A3, and A4. Again, that is not physiologically possible, but I still have to allow the mathematical possibility for that to happen. Okay. And then we calculate the different uh, predictors and correctors of the, of the runge kutta system, um, meaning K1, using A1 and B1, as you can see. K2, using B2 and K2. I'm sorry, K2 and A2. B2 and A2. And then K3 using A3 and B3, and then K4 using A4 and B4. And remember, A1, A2, A3, and A4 are going to be either 
the ACC for close close, AOC for open close, ACO for close open, or AOO for open open, depending on what the pressure conditions are. At the end of these, then I calculate, I estimate the solution of the next time level as a linear combination of these predictors and correctors, K1 through K4, um, divided by six. Hopefully, after implementing this, I get a converged solution. And indeed I, indeed, indeed I get a converged solution. So notice that we start our initial conditions from values of 80 and 10 for the pressure. So again, once I return the value of Y, remember that Y is an array, it's a two-dimensional array that contains all the time steps and it contains as many columns as state variables. In this case, state, column number one is state variable one, which is the pressure of the left atrium. Column number two is the pressure of the left ventricle. Column number three is the pressure of the aorta. Column number four is the, is the flow in the aorta. And column number five is the systemic pressure. All right, so notice that we start with these values of the initial conditions, 10 and 10 for the pressure of the left ventricle and the pressure of the left atrium, and 80, 80 for the pressure of the aorta and the systemic pressure, right? So they progress through five times uh, hard cycles, but at the same time, they adapt to the real values of the real solution. So after the fifth hard cycle, everything has settled to what the heart actually is, is doing. So notice now that these pressures actually correspond a lot more and they look a lot more to what the actual physiological pressures of a person will look like. It's no longer a sinusoidal wave driving the, the, the these uh, cardiac system or the cardiac circuit. It's, it's, it's values that because of the double heel function of the elastins dictated by the double heel function, our values are physiologically very close to what you will find with uh, catheter data, for example. If you were able to stick a catheter somewhere in the aorta or somewhere in the systemic circulation, you'll see this blue line or this red, I'm sorry, this uh, red line or this black line uh, follow through very, very uh, closely. Another thing that's important is to note that you can actually tell exactly when each of the valves is opening or closing. See, for example, the red line corresponds to the aortic pressure, while the blue line corresponds to the ventricular pressure. Remember that the ventricle and the aorta, and the aorta are connected through the uh, to the aortic valve. So when the aortic valve opens, there is mechanical equilibrium between these two uh, sections, and therefore the pressure on the left ventricle should be equal to the pressure on the aorta. And that happens from this point to this point. So from this point to this point, notice that the red line and the blue line are equal to each other. That's exactly when the aortic valve is open. That is the ejection phase, right? You can also tell, for example, when the, the ventricular pressure is equal to the uh, atrial pressure. So the atrial pressure is always very low because that is the return pressure. It actually has the pressure of the incoming venous system going to the left atrium, right? Um, so, but when the, during the period of filling, so when the ventricle is being filled from the atrium, the mitral valve is open. And at that point, there's mechanical equilibrium between the atrium and the ventricle. And therefore, these two pressures are the same. That occurs exactly from this point to this point. So this is the point where the mitral valve is open and then the aortic valve is closed. This is called uh, the, the filling period, right? Um, and you can tell when both valves are closed. That would be when there's no mechanical equilibrium between either the left atrial pressure and the left ventricular pressure or between the left ventricular pressure and the aortic pressure between the blue and the red. And that is basically from this point, which is the contraction, and from this point to this point, which is the relaxation. Okay, so this is the isobulimic contraction from this point to this point, then ejection, then isobulimic relaxation, and then filling. Then you have the three phases of the system. The, the phase or the switch state in which both valves are open never occurs. There's never a point in the system where all pressures are in equilibrium with each other, where at least PLA, PLB, and PAO are in equilibrium with each other. That will be the time where, all, where, where both valves are open simultaneously. That never occurs. More importantly, when we look at the aortic flow, this is what we get. We get something that is rather more physiologically relevant, more physiologically true than what we have been getting before, which is in reality what happens. When the aortic valve is open, which is during this period, we have a fast ejection from the ventricle, and that actually perfuses the entire systemic circulation. That fast burst of, of blood flow out of the ventricle is what actually diffuses through the entire circulation and, uh, and meets the physiological demand.
not something like a, like a sinusoidal wave as we have been getting before by driving the system from a condition where, or from a pump or, or with a pump that simulates a, a sinusoidal uh, signal. So this is very, very close to what happens in reality. So we have these areas where we have mechanical equilibrium between the different chambers uh, dictated by the opening and closing of the valves. And then we have these fast bursts burst of ejection uh, from, the, from the ventricle that produces these uh, these peaks of, uh, of flow, and then when the valve closes, actually we have these uh, these uh, large periods of rest. Now these these little wiggles right here are actual n actually not numerical artifacts. These are actual physiological things that are captured by even these very simplified model of this uh, cardiovascular circuit. Uh, these these things like the the notches and the uh, and the and the attempt to retrograde flow. Are actually captured that at the moment when the valve actually closes we have this hammer effect with the flow actually trying to return back into the ventricle but it can't because the ventricle is a check valve or the ventric or, or the aortic valve is a check valve and it doesn't let any flow through in, in reverse that will be the time where the coronary arteries if we had them actually in the model as a different compartments the coronary arteries will actually get perfused by this little attempt of the flow to go negative and there's enough momentum of the flow going back to actually perfuse through the coronaries. And that, that's accomplished uh, during, during this period right here. But it's actually very interesting, again, that even with these very simplified five degree of freedom or five state variable model of the cardiovascular system, we're able to capture things that are so precise and so physiologically relevant as these. Furthermore, what I did here is I... I I am basically integrating over this last curve on the fifth or last cycle. I am saying on the last cycle, just add up all these values of Q and integrating over to integrate them over time, right? So that I can actually calculate the value of flow rate that is ejected from the ventricle in, in one cycle. That's called a cardiac ejection. So basically what I'm doing, as I said, is integrating from the last, uh, from the beginning of the last cycle, right here, all the way to the end of the last cycle, right here. So I'm multiplying the values of QAO times the value of delta T, so essentially integrating. And uh, and then I'm dividing by the value of delta of, of TC. So I'm calculating an average, an integrated average of this flow rate. And then I'm multiplying times 60 and dividing, dividing that by 1000 to transform this value from milliliter seconds to liters per minute. So this is in milliliters per second. I am calculating the average value on the last cycle right, by integrating and dividing by the, the actual duration of the cycle. And then I'm transforming that into liters per minute. And as you can see, this is a very physiologically relevant value. 4.28 liters per minute is essentially what a healthy adult will actually be producing in, in terms of cardiac output um, when, in, when the person is at rest. If you were to go all the way to the top and say, okay, now let's make this person go into some level of activity. Now this person is walking. The heart rate is 90. Okay, notice that the duration of the heart cycle is now 0 0.667, but everything is adjusted automatically because I don't have to worry about anything because I, I set up the system to evaluate five heart cycles with 200 time steps each. So I don't need to adjust for the fact that the duration of each cycle is different now. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the systemic resistance now to one. The person is walking, and therefore there is a uh, there is a uh, biochemical process by which uh, these the, the the vessels in in the systemic in the, in the systemic circulation uh, comply, and, and therefore allowing more blood through so that you can oxygenate um, more areas in your body, more cells, or more muscles, and then um, effectively reducing the value of the systemic resistance. And if you do that and rerun this set of equations, which takes some time. Notice that the pressures now go into different values. Now, the minimum pressure is about 90 or so, and the highest pressure is when we're I'm talking about aortic pressure, anywhere from 90 to 140. So the, 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 uh, the pressure, the systolic and diastolic pressure, went to 140 over 90 in this case. The flow rate actually increased over 600 milliliters per second at the peak. And if you actually update this value, now this person is producing 6.28 liters per minute of blood uh, through heart injection.
So this number is actually quite high. It's higher compared to the to the value of rest. And if you keep going, let's say and now, okay, now this person is in high level of activity. This person is running. The heart rate is 120. And let's say now that this person went into a level of activity that is 0.75, where the systemic resistance is 0.75, very low, uh, therefore requiring more blood. And let's see what happens. See, the pressure is actually, this, the diastolic pressure went up in comparison to the previous prior diastolic pressure. The diastolic pressure is right here about 100, and the systolic pressure is about 135. That's typical when you increase your level of activity. And, and notice now that, uh, well, it looks like this is um, the peak of this uh, aortic uh, flow is about the same. It's slightly less than 700 milliliters per minute. But this curve is actually wider. So if we evaluate this and transform into liters per minute, now we're at 8.2. So from being at rest and producing about 4 liters per minute of blood, um, we went into a high level of activity um, and producing 8.2 liters per minute. Okay, and you can actually increase that value by increasing the level of activity, increasing the heart rate. Um, you, you cannot kill the person by putting in 200 beats per minute, but, but you can try that. Okay. We can say, okay, what, what if the person is actually performing some very serious, uh, exercise, uh, high cardio where the, the heart rate is about 180. Most of the cycle is being occupied by systole. It's not even completed. And the level of activity is so high that the systemic resistance is 0 0.5. Let's see if it's able, able to capture that. Well, it, it didn't work. We, we essentially killed that patient. Notice that the, the, um, the uh, uh, pressure went up to almost 200 and actually keeps increasing and increasing. And now it's completely out of control. And if you keep evaluating this, uh, the, the pressure will keep increasing. And the blood flow will keep increasing, and all the way at the point that it that the person will need 90 liters per minute to to keep up with that level of activity and that systemic resistance, which the heart obviously is not able to produce. So that didn't work. So that person will faint, and the heart rate will slowly go down. Let me see if 150 will work. Which perhaps it will. Still trying to go up, and uh, and not not stabilizing. So this person is really in bad shape. Thirteen point six liters per minute. That's not what a person. A person can actually a, a healthy adult heart can produce maybe all the way up to ten liters per minute. So this is this is way too much for a person. So I'm going to bring it down to rest. This person went into cardiac arrest, or just fainted. And then the heart went down to 60 beats per minute and the systemic resistance choked down, choked up to two. And then now this person, let's see, it's back to normal. Okay. Now the ejection is only 3.4 liters per minute. So that's how these, this uh, system works. <coughs> and notice that the solution of this algorithm is taking quite a bit of time because we're using 10,000 time steps to evaluate because we don't have an adapted time stepping process here. And uh, so this is just for illustration purposes. This is not an algorithm that can be included into a feedback control loop, for example, because it's too slow. It's too slow to respond. Okay, sometimes we need to make decisions within one time step or within one heart cycle to be able to save somebody if that somebody is actually fitted with a pacemaker or, or, a, or an assist device of some kind. All right, so... Let me go back to the notes and to the camera. And uh, so this is it for today. I'll be posting this notes and this uh, um, MathCAD spreadsheet uh, for your perusal. And um, uh, what, when we reconvene for another lecture, I'm going to introduce another element to, these, to the circuit to make it slightly more complicated. When one in, in the cases where a patient is actually uh, has suffered some kind of congestive disease and we need to mitigate that. So thank you for your attention and I'll see you next time.